Hertz. Louis Hertz wrote in his book Along the Tin Plate Rails uh, and dedicated a whole chapter to Dorfan. And in the book, he says, if the past could be recaptured, and I had my choice of some one day I could spend again, I'm sure none would offer more pleasure than to spend one more day with the Forshammer brothers and John Corbett at the old Dorfan factory on Jackson Street, Newark, New Jersey. Dorfan was Louis Hertz's very favorite manufacturer. And in the 1930s, he tried to save the company and invested in it deeply. And much of my collection comes from Louis Hertz. Uh, in fact, I have most of his, his paper collection. I brought over there some paper if we had time. I wish you, know, you could look through it. I have um, many, many things from the Dorfan company that are absolutely wonderful that would have been lost if it hadn't been for the Hertz. Also, I wanted to recognize um, these two people. Uh, I mentioned Carl McKinney. Uh, his book, I had it here. If you haven't seen it, uh, and if you're interested in door fan trains, it, it is a spectacular book. Spectacular. You can buy it. There's one on eBay right now, actually. They usually go for about $100. Um, and the books include two other manufacturers. So Three, I thought. Uh, there are three in the book. And, um, you know, anyway. The other uh, person I'd, uh, I'd like to dedicate to, and by the way, I got the chance to meet Carlton before he died, and um, he, he was just amazing when it came to Dorfan. He knew uh, so much about it, had, had knew all the famous collectors of the day, and what, what was unique about him that is not something that I'm very good at is he wanted to understand the engineering inside the train. He was an electrical engineer and quite an erudite guy. And he wanted to dig into how the trains electrically all worked, which is um, beyond my capability. Lou Hertz, um, because as a historian, he saved so much of what we know about Dorfan today. If it hadn't been for Louis Hertz, most of this collection would be gone, and most of what I know about Dorfan will be gone as well. As Dorfan started to get older uh, and more mature, he was invited into the factory and actually had access to all of their files. I have. Um, much of the Dorfan correspondence that Louis Hertz had in his collection, which he took from their files uh, when they went uh, bankrupt. Uh, so he saved a lot. Unfortunately, um, as Louis Hertz got older, much of his paper collection was destroyed. Um, and that's probably the loss of the number. Destroyed how? He, he was a diabetic, and he became blind. And he had apparently a plumbing leak in his house. And after he died, people went to his house and they said there were dumpsters filled with antique paper. Tim Bay Yeah. All, all wet and mushy and ruined, right? Um, what was Hertz's profession or occupation? He was a writer. He was, yeah, he was a yeah, professional he, he writer. He wrote his first book when he was like 15 years old. And, and he started magazines mm -hmm. and, you know, it was amazing. John can tell you more about it. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me talk about the history of Dorfan. Uh, actually, the story begins in 1910 when um, a fellow named Joseph Krauss and Julius Vorschein, who were first cousins, formed the Joseph Krauss and Company, Fandor Company, in Nuremberg, Germany. And um, I had the opportunity to go to Germany a couple of times and had some friends that uh, were German who took me down and when we did research and, and the history of the family and everything. 
and of all of the Nuremberg families is fascinating because almost everyone who managed the train industry in Germany were Jewish. And many of them, you know, went through the Holocaust. Uh, and the fact that the Forsheimer brothers left Germany to come to the United States saved them, but their families were lost. Joseph Krauss, uh, so goes the lore, uh, because he had money. The night before they were coming for him in 1936, uh, he was he was warned. Somebody warned him that they were the Nazis were going to come and get him, and he was able to escape and go to England, and eventually came to the United States. Um, I'm <coughs> trying to research all this stuff so, because there's so much lore that goes into this. For example, one of the one of the things that people talk about is that the, the Fandor factories in Germany were bombed as much as Nuremberg was destroyed uh, during World War II. But when I went to Germany, I was able to find the factory. And this friend of mine and I went down to the factory and we were taking pictures and this Turkish woman came out and started swearing at, at us in <laughs> Turkish German until we explained that you know, we were interested in this, this factory because it had been a toy train factory. And she said, oh yes, when I bought the place, there were trains everywhere. I threw them all away. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1921, Julius Forsheimer came to the United States and did some scouting. And in 1923, he and his brother Milton came to the United States. Now, if you understand the German toy train industry a little bit, up until World War I, most of the toys in the United States were made in Germany, particularly by the Bing Corporation. That was the largest toy company in the world. But Fandor uh, was a very famous line of less expensive trains. Much like American Flyer was, re was, was thought to be less expensive than Lionel, Fandor was considered to be less expensive than Martin and Bing. Um, and up through 1910, all the way up through, through World War I, they were enormously successful. But World War I, and I had a German grandmother told me about what it was like to be German during and after World War I. Uh, after World War I, American Flyer and the American toy industry got the Senate and the U.S. government to ban or to put heavy levies on, on imported toys from Germany. Uh, plus, nobody wanted it in Germany. So th the whole thing died. And so we don't know for sure. But I think one of the reasons the Forsheimer brothers came to the United States was to, to start up a company in the United States and feed off of the success that Fandor had and build a great company in the United States based on that because they couldn't import anything. Were they financed by... Uh, I'm sorry? Were they financed by Krauss? Probably, yeah. Because they, I have extensive letters, which, by the way, were written in English, uh, from Milton Forsheimer to Joseph Krauss detailing all of the distributors, and, and I have many pictures that were made uh, to do advertising that showed Dorfan trains with Fandor cars. So my guess is uh, that prior to uh, the Forsheimers come to America, the Fandor company dealt through jobbers, through dealers. And that wasn't satisfactory, so when the Forsheimers came here, they directly took charge of that. And then they brought John C. Korber. John Christian Korber obviously was not Jewish. <laughs> Um, so he came to America and he took up the mantle of, uh, of coming up with a whole new aura of trains. Somewhere here, I don't know what I did with them, uh, I have all of the patents. I don't know what I did with them. Maybe somebody yeah, yeah. else. Um, they're amazing because these, these came from the Dorfian factory and John Korber was a meticulous, typical German guy. He kept detailed records of everything. I have a lot of paper that has his name written in it. Every time he got a piece of paper, he filed it, and he always had a stamp put on it, John C. Corp, from the desk of John C. Corp. But these are all of the original patents that came from the Dorfan factory that he had in his possession. And now I have in my possession. So they're very interesting to look at. And in 1923, 24, and, and starting in 1924, uh, he was granted patents um, for the um, first Dorfan train, which you see in the movie. And it was, uh, I thought I had, oh, it's over here, so it was a kit. So the first Dorfan trains were <coughs> trains, and they came taken apart. And your job was to put them together. Mm -hmm. So here is one of the original kits. There were about six of these. Uh, there's only two of the six types I've ever seen, and this is the more common of the two, uh, but extre extremely rare, particularly in this condition. Um, but all the parts are in here, and it came with instructions, and all the parts are numbered. So I would say take number number five gear and put it here and do this and do that, and the boys could do it. So 
Part of the motor is on in those red. Uh, yeah, here's the motor right here. Okay, and the motor fit into the casting. Let's see if I can get one of these castings out. So there's an A casting, it's marked A, and a B casting. And the two castings fit together. And if you can see it, there's these little circles here that pins fit through that go on to the, to the headlights. So for example, here's a headlight, put that pin down through there and it held the A and B unit together. Mm. So a boy could take it apart by just pulling the pin. Mm. Um, um, but all the parts for this particular one are in here. Um, and um, that, that was their first train. Here's the actual commutator. Um, and, and the brushes, here are the brushes. Um, and the pickups. This is actually a later version. It has a double pickup. The, the earliest ones only had single pickups. And a gear that fed off of the motor to run the wheels. The wheels themselves, you'll notice, have, uh, as part of the casting, these wheels are cast again, have gears cast into the wheels. So as the castings became a problem for Dorfman, so did the whole thing. Uh, because metallurgy was an, was an imprecise science in those years, um, the very earliest of the Dorfman castings warped, disintegrated, zinc pest, you've heard the story, but Dorfman was probably more, well, not probably, they were more um, subject to that than any other company because if the casting warped, nothing ran. Mm -hmm. Whereas with an with a eye strain, if the casting warped, well, the insert still ran, mm -hmm. even though the, the casting looked like. Here's McKinney's book, by the way, you see it. Um, so, anyway, um, let me go down this way and, and start a little bit. I don't want to go into great detail, but <coughs> here are a couple of Fandor sets, um, very famous for their wind-up toys. Um, this happens to be an American version of this. Roger and I have researched it, lots of, um, or several German versions, and I have um, a book of all of the catalogs <coughs> from all of the German manufacturers, and you can buy that if you have, you know, some money to do it, uh, but it's very expensive, but somebody published all of these catalogs. It's the only reason we have it. Um, so anyway, here is a wind-up. This is the wind-up train. Fandor also made freight sets. Um, this happens to be um, another wind-up, simple key. These things all still run. If you look at the cars, this particular car, and look at a door fan car, and then look at a Fandor car, you'll see huge similarity. Uh, Doc Robinson wrote in the article that Peter put out that uh, Although Fandor and Dorfan had very close relationships, Dorfan was a very uniquely American company. I would take great issue with that. Uh, because frankly, all of the, of the Dorfan windups were made by Fandor. All of the accessories, all the tunnels, all the bridges, all the track, all the, and many of the castings were made by Fandor. So it was a tremendously close relationship. And it was much cheaper to manufacture in Germany than it was.
This particular one is the German version, but uh, th these were made where they had cow catchers on the front. So they put a cow catcher on the front for the American market, take it off for the German market. Very interesting. Oh, here's another example of that. You can see it better here. See this cow catcher? Just rip it off and sell it in Germany, put it on, sell it in the United States. Uh, it shows the ingenuity of John Corbett. Um, so these trains were very popular in Germany from 1910 all the way up through the 20s until, you know, the American market dried up on them. At which time, um, John Corber and the Forsheimer brothers decided they were going to start manufacturing here. And in 1924, they came out with the first trains. And um, one of the very first trains <coughs> they came out with is this train, and they were wind-ups, was what some people call the electric wind-up. Mm -hmm. And this set sold for $1.25. Actually, I have two engines here because the color is slightly different. Shows you how anal collecting can become. Uh, if you notice the difference in orange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they go on different days, maybe. But these cars are, are incredibly interesting because they're so simple. Um, I have here, from, and, and uh, Hertz published a picture of this, and McKinney had this at one time as well. It's framed, but it's a stamping of a famous car. And you can see the similarity here. It showed how the cars were made. They were lithographed. And the Germans were fabulous at lithography. They were lithographed under a flat sheet. The yellow pieces were punched out. And then the cars were folded to make you know, a simple car. Um, very effective lithography. Uh, Fandor, um, Bing, and Markman were all fabulous. But probably Bing and, and Fandor were the best at lithography of anyone in the world. And when, and when uh, Corber came to the United States, you'll see that some of the Dorfian stuff is incredible. Not, seems to have it. Not that American Flyer wasn't great as well. I thought they did well. Some of the accessories that very early on here show some of the tunnels and, and, and accessories that came in a box for the wind-up generation, but also to fit the O-gauge generation. There's a number of versions of, of uh, Door fan wind-up sets. I brought a whole number of here, but we don't really have time. What's interesting about um, the door fan wind-ups is the castings, which were made in the United States. So they, these are inserted. Uh, these have inserts into the castings. So the wind-up casting was made in the United States. The wind-up insert was made in Germany. So close synergy between the two companies. This is the larger of the two types of uh, uh, wind-up castings which is identical in many ways to the castings used in the O-gauge electric, except this one has a button on the front, whereas in the O-gauge they drill this out and put a light in. Um, however, there are exceptions to that, and here's the smaller casting, and this one has a light. So what's that about? Well, this one happened to have had a tender that carried with it a battery, and it plugged in. You can see this little plug. So it's a wind-up that had an electric light. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Remember during the 20s, 80% um, of the people in the United States did not have electricity. It was Boston and New York and Chicago and big cities and Richmond. Mm -hmm. but, but very few rural people. And, and at that time, you know, this country was not dominated by the urban world. It was dominated by the rural world in terms of population. So people didn't have that stuff. So wind-up trains, uh, push trains, very popular, and of course the earliest of the electrics um, often came with dry cell batteries and some weird stuff, right? Um, in fact, Dorfman um, not only decided they were going to compete in every single one of the markets, O-gauge and standard gauge, but they were going to compete with all the accessories, all the track, all the transformers, and everything it took um, to do a train. And I have um, a couple of transformers that ha are 20 cycle transformers. So what's that? Well, it turns out that upstate New York and other places in the country operated off 20-cycle current. Hmm. That was before there were standards. So one of the things that I like about our hobby is if you look back in the history of toy train collecting, it also mirrors the advent of consumer electronics in this country. In fact, many of you have seen you know, transformers that screw into light bulb fixtures. You know, that kind of thing is very common. If you look at some of the German catalogs, it's even more bizarre. Uh, but there were no standards. And I'll show you something a little later that, that is even more weird about that. Um, because there were no light bulb standards either. Um, until Thomas Edison came along. 
Um, about 1925, Dorfman decided to enter the electric train market. Again, it had a, a small casting, which was very similar, in fact, identical to this casting uh, for the wind-ups. Um, and it was um, mirrored with the large casting for electrics, which uh, is shown here, almost identical to this again, but the, these, some of these had electric lights. What was the number on that larger one, John? Uh, the number on the, these trains? Is that a 55? The, the bigger one is the 55 and the smaller one is, is the 50. Yeah. Um, where was I? Okay. Uh, taking part um, one of the earliest trains that Peter showed, which was on the cover of the 1925 Dorfman catalog, happens to be this train, which will never run again, but is a nice shelf piece. It was a tiny little train, and you can see it was the one that the boy took apart and put together. Uh, there are three versions of this through the 10 years that Dorfman manufactured trains, um, and uh, you can see all of them here. They, um, they produced a whole series of passenger cars to go with their trains. This is the earliest of the passenger cars. Um, it had um, a, a brass label on the top, which they soon did away with. Um, the um, other kinds of passenger cars, you can see these, the little ones, the four-wheelers, um, as well as a whole series of lithographed and very beautiful, I think, O-gauge uh, free cars. They had uh, many different kinds. You'll see, you'll see them later. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to address, if I can find it here, was um, Louis Hertz basically said that he felt that Dorfan was, was the most creative of all the toy train companies. And um, that's primarily because of John, John Corver. And I thought I had here, and, and if I find it, I can, I can do it, um, a, a list of all of the innovations. By the way, uh, Fandor, as this says, the name came from Fanny and Dora, who were the mothers of Joseph Krauss and, and the four Schoenberg brothers. And when they came to the United States, they switched them from Fandor to Dorfman. So, interesting. Um, I, thought I, had, I thought I had that. I, I can't find it, so I'll have to go around. Um, one of the things about uh, the Dorfman company that I find interesting is that they had more variations in sets than, than any other train company in the United States, even though uh, they were only in business for about 10 years. And here's just a listing of some of the um, narrow gauge electric freight sets that they had. And the reason that they had so much variation in their sets, they had like over 20 passenger sets that they sold for all those years, is that they would take all the cars and all the engines and come out with a myriad of colors and designs and different, different aspects to them. So here's an example for example, uh, here's an example of some of the colors in the O-Gage um, line in their uh, 55 engine. So, you know, they had the black, and by the way, they had these bands, sometimes they were painted, sometimes they were gold, sometimes they were white, sometimes they were yellow. This shows it in green, orange, red, green, and um, I think that looks like a maroon, but they called it Dorfman Brown. <laughs> what I find interesting about the green ones is they never bored the hole here for the light. For whatever reason, the green ones, even though this is an electric, didn't have the electric light, they used the, uh, the same casting but didn't bother to. Uh, my guess is that what happened is that later in their life as they were having financial difficulty and they didn't have the time to bore the light out, so they just didn't. Although that was... Um, not like John C. Corbett to do that. A lot of their sets were very intricate. You can see here they had uh, their famous blocks, famous to those people who care. Block signal, very similar to some of the line Elmer and Flair block signals where the trains can be controlled. Um, so it came with a block signal where you could stop the train in front of the station and all that. A Toy Town station. I said all of the stations that Rhino, or that uh, Dorfman ever made were, were made by Fandor, but that's actually not true. This one was actually made by Shine. So, uh -huh. Shine. With a C, I guess. C H E I N. Is that, did I say it right? Yeah. And then here's, of course, the Tom. And then it, and then it came with, you know, various versions of the, of the signals. 
Just show them the tunnel, John. It's a really pretty tunnel. It's a nice tunnel. They made two versions of this. This is obviously German. And it shows on a nice. horse and cart going up a, a road. I just don't think you know you saw too much of that in America. Maybe you did. I don't know. The car looks like a German car. Interestingly enough, um, I, I got into the boxes. There are lots of variations on the boxes, and people that get into collecting sometimes fall in love with the boxes, which is you know, something about our hobby that's really crazy. This is one of the first boxes Dorfman ever came out with, and here is the label on it. The box is literally falling apart, but the label is intact. And it shows a boy holding an American flag with knickers running a German train. And uh, what is that? I don't know. But if you look at the train, it's definitely German. Uh, so kind of interesting. That was a very early set. I think maybe they didn't, they didn't know better. Then the original Dorfman Dan. Here he is. This is the only one of these I've ever seen. But on the 1925 catalog, he's on the cover. And this is the only box I've ever seen with Dorfman, the first Dorfman Dan. Um, Dan, D-A-N. D-A-N, right. And then here's another version of the um, of Dorf and Dan, you know, with his knickers and the German. You can see easily the German train. Yeah. Obviously not an American train. So what is that? And then later on, you had this boy, who's a more Americanized kind of version of Dorf and the, the, the guy. Um, the, um, the first standard gauge trains that Dorf and ever made uh, came out in 1926. And this is the first train Dorfman ever made. It is a, a casting problem because as, as the years went by, Dorfman got much better at their metallurgy, but in the early years, this stuff kind of fell apart. So this one is really fragile. But if you look real carefully, in the window up here, you see Dorfman Dan. Dorfman was the first company to put passengers in their cars. And in this case, they had one in their train. But it only happened in 1925. Uh, or 26, after 1926. Somehow Dorf and Dan got lost and never came back again. Um, interestingly enough. Um, the lithography was a very interesting thing. And here's some examples of Dorf and's lithography in standard, in standard gauge trains. They had two types of cars, lithograph cars and very highly glossed painted cars. So here's a green version. You see that one? You see here. The res red version, uh, very rare to have one, have a, actually have a, uh, an observation car. Uh, in the, uh, these were the cheaper sets, by the way, the lithography sets. There was a, um, the orange one, which I think should have called, been called the Orange Blossom Special, but it wasn't. <laughs> and, and then there's uh, this one, which is, I don't know what color you call it, mustard? Yeah. Something like that. So they have lots of different variations in color and style. And they put all that together in different combinations to create a great variety of stuff for kids. And um, the other train they came out with later was the 3920, which was the St. Paul. And here is a version of it, the Orange Blossom Festival version of it. Uh, this particular train uh, came out in 1929, and therefore it will run. Uh, I showed some folks the other day when. Bob Timmons came out to my house and I, I said, you're about to see something nobody really ever sees and that's a dwarf entry that actually runs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, that's, that's unfair because a lot of these trades, it's a passion of mine to try to get them to run, but it can take you uh, weeks to try to get one to run. And J.B. Weld is your best friend. Um, here is what some people call the crocodile, which is the 3930, the first original. I mean, this is the original. And, and this is, you know, what followed on. The green one is probably the most prominent of them. Uh, Crocodile was a German name with, with a K. No, no, no. Okay. I thought. I, I don't. I have never seen any literature in the Dorfman literature that called these crocodiles. No. But I've seen people did that. F1. Uh, some of the other German trains were called there is a crocodile with a K. Swiss yeah. engine. One of my favorite standard gauge trains is this guy, which is called the Florida one. And here it is. It's an extremely rare set. This one runs too, which you know I'm happy to say. And here are all the cars, and they're my, one of my favorites. What can I say? They're they're a beautiful set. I wish I could spread them all out for you to see. 
Um, the other thing that Dorfman did in the 1920s with their standard gauge was came out with some incredible lithography on their freight cars. And uh, here's a set which has most of the freight cars. In fact, it has all the freight cars. Um, <coughs> Here's their gondola, New York Central. This is a um, very sought after car. You can find it occasionally on eBay or at New York. Um, lithography is just incredibly beautiful. Um, the uh, box car, really nice. All of these are original uh, in every way. And then um, the caboose. The people who are really anal about dwarf fan, the caboose comes in about four different versions and it all has to do with the gates in the back. Some are painted, some are nickel, some are brass, uh, some are rusted, but <laughs> many are rusted. But um, anyway, there's that one. And it came, what didn't come with a set was the uh, lumber car, which is therefore the most rare of all of them. And uh, thanks to Peter, I was able to duplicate the loads. Of course, the kids, always lost the loads, right? So because our good friend Mr. McKinney and his tremendous research was able to tell us exactly the size of what these loads look like and, and Peter had these made for me, um, which is nice. We did have uh, on the O-gauge version uh, the good fortune of, of having one of the cars, if I can find it, yeah, it's here it is, which has the original load. And here it is. And it says Lackawanna 712384, whatever that means. That's the original load. So, for whatever reason, that is fabulous. Um, anyway, um, Dwarfman came out with uh, a number of different sets in the years. Um, John Corber obviously loved electric outline cars. And so, I can uh, show you some of these. He, um, he produced the 51 which is the first train I showed you, which has embossed on it 51. Now, Dorfman was also the first toy train maker to use decals. And they figured out that it was easier for them to use decals than to um, you know, have these intricate castings. So later in the process, if I have one here, I don't know if I do. Uh, I don't know if I brought it, but I have, I have many, where the 51 became a, uh, uh, it had a simpler casting and it had a decal. 51. There was a 52 as well that I looked identical. Then there was the 53, which is a St. Paul, and these are extremely beautiful trains. Well, I can't, I can't get it out of the box, but you can see it. They're very difficult um, to get running because they have a lot of metal that warped and fell apart. Uh, whoever sold me this, I can't remember now, was so proud of it because it says, runs good. <laughs> so that, you know, yeah, you well for it. <laughs> so you had 51, 52, the 53. Um, I don't know what I did with the 54. I don't have it. Either. I brought it, but I think it's, I, didn't, I wasn't able to get it out. So it's very unique. Uh, it's, it's a New York Central boxcar, and, it, and you can recognize it instantly because it's iridescent. It has an iridescent blue color. I'm sorry, I can't see one. I didn't bring it, I guess. Um, yeah. So anyway, in the O-Gage, they had a tremendous variety of uh, electric outline. And then in the, uh, in the locomotive series, they had, you know, this guy, which uh, was their, their mainstay for many, many, many years, the 55. In uh, 1930, um, John Korberg came to the market with some incredible new trains. And um, <coughs> these are perhaps the rarest of any trains anywhere because this train here appeared in the New York showroom in 1930. It is made out of brass, incredibly heavy. It's a two engine um, uh, 460. It actually would have perhaps, perhaps had a trailer. This is a, the prototype, door fan, the only door fan standard gauge <coughs> locomotive, steam locomotive outline ever made. And we know almost nothing about it except this ad, which says Dorfan offers for 1931, which would have been 1930. A sensational new development in modern remote control, wide gauge steam type engines. Wide gauge meaning standard gauge. Come to the toy fair in New York and we'll show it to you. Well, we don't know exactly what happened, but what we presume 
Um, a friend of mine, Randy Berger, up in Pittsburgh, who many of you may know, is a pretty famous collector. He wrote some articles on that, and that they took this train to the toy fair and the dealers loved it. And then they got back to Newark and didn't have the money to make it. So they went to Lionel and said, well, can you sell us the Ives 1134 castings? Now, you know, Lionel and, and American Flyer bought Ives in 1928, as you, many of you know, mm. when, when, when uh, Ives went bankrupt. And um, American Flyer took the 11, famous 1134 engine, and this is what it looked like, by the way, a monster the best that I've ever made. And, and American Flyer actually made a version of this for their toy train line. Lionel never did. So the presumption is that because Lionel was in Irvington, New Jersey and Dorfman was two miles away in Newark, that um, Dorfman bought the castings from Lionel and sold these to the people who wanted this train. And so, but it wasn't real successful. It didn't work well. So today, and by the way, these had same test problems too. Here's a, a green one. This is this is one of my favorite, very favorite trains. Um, this train had been overpainted black, and a um, young man who knows how to do that was able to get the black off without ruining the green paint, which is the original Dorfman green. This is what Dorfman. But they also made it in black, and here's the black one. Well, they're not put together trains. No, these are not put together. You can take them apart, but you've got to be. I understand like, that. There are four of these known to exist. There are three of these known to exist. And um, they're, they're really incredible trains. Um, uh, you'll see them on eBay because Mike's train house uh, came out with an 1134. And so you buy the Mike's green house version of it. But, you know, it's, it's the Mike's green house version. In, in addition to the um, standard gauge versions, Dorfan also came out with a prototype for O-gauge. And here it is. And they did advertise this in their 1931 catalog. This is again a brass uh, O-gauge um, engine. And they did that by taking the 1930 catalog, because Dorfman didn't have enough money to produce 31, 32, 33, 34 catalogs. So all the catalogs, 1930 through 1938, were 1930 catalogs. But they differed them by putting inserts into the catalog. The catalog was this size, and they put the insert in. Here is the insert they put in, showing this prototype train. I've got it turned wrong. Well, no, I don't. No, sorry. So it showed this with an Ives tender. Um, and they advertised this train in the 31 catalog. Um, here, actually, to show you how anal I'm about Dorfman is the print plate that produced this. It's kind of cool. But, um, and here's the tender that went with it, which is actually a Dorfman tender. Um, but they never produced that train either. And, uh, Instead, they came out with the Ives 1122, which they also bought from Lionel. And here it is. And there's only one of these known to exist other than this one. Which Andy Berger has, and he wrote articles about it. This happens to be the prototype. It came from the factory. What happened to them all, John? I don't know. I, I just don't think they were very successful in making them. And here's the tender, the Ives tender. Both with Dorfan couplers, and this one happens to be interesting. And I just noticed part of it's broken. I have to glue it together, but it has Dorfan stampings all through it, so it's very interesting. But it was Corber's personal prototype that he tried to make. In this case, however, uh, Corber was able to make an engine that um, was an improvement, but not as good as the prototype. And here it is, right here, called the 770. Carl wrote about it a lot in his book. And it's the finest uh, O-gauge engine uh, Dorfman ever made. It's fabulous. And it runs like a bat. And yeah, their own design. It's beautifully designed. And it was the first train to have automatic reverse, remote control. And that's another first for the Dorfman company. First toy train company to do lithography, cast uh, in the way they did it. First toy train company to do um, you know, die casting and the first train company to do automatic reversing and, and automatic controls, and here's the controller. So, when did they put that out? 1930. When? 1930. They didn't have automatic before that? No. You could reverse an engine, but it wasn't automatic. Now, Ives had the automatic um, reversing with the on-off, but it wasn't remotely uh, controlled except by turning the transformer on and off. So this thing, 
was different because what actually happened here is you, you didn't take the thing into a neutral. You actually could reverse it immediately, which perhaps caused some problems. But anyway, interesting. You think? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, if you ever tried to put your car in reverse when you're. <laughs> anyway, that's another matter. Um, Good thing it didn't do really. Perhaps, though, the most intriguing of, of the stories of, of Dorf and Pandora are, are, are these Taylor Gates trains. Um, in addition, out of the Louis Hertz collection, I got this, which came out in 1927 but was never produced, which was John Corber playing around with trying to do you know, streamliners. Of course, the uh, Dorf End never did this, you know, and neither did anyone else in Standard Gage. Lionel and Mark Flyer <laughs> did it in O-Gage. Um, Ten I, years later. I guess in uh, 2006, Lionel <clears throat> came out with a Standard Gage streamliner. 2006. Uh, wide, wide gauge Standard Is gauge. that the only one? No one ever did a Standard Gage uh, streamliner. No, is, is that, that the prototype? The oh, this is just a prototype that he played with, yes. <laughs> 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 I have a friend of mine, his name is Carl Needlinger. If you ever go to New York, he always has a booth there and he has, always has a lot of Dorf fan things. And he made for me a Dorf fan trolley. And he used this design as the trolley. So he took Dorf fan cars and then made a, an absolutely beautiful Dorf fan trolley. And of course, Dorf fan Dan is in, in the cockpit. Right? So who else would you have there? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dorf fan's uh, flight into accessories. Tremendous number of accessories. I have a bunch up there, but you know, wind up, except a, a wind up bridge. So, very unusual. I have a, a bunch of these, and, and I have one. Um, the only difference between this and the Fandor ones are, are that these were painted. So, the presumption is that, um, that often Fandor would make up the trains, they'd send them to the United States, and then Dorf End would paint them their own color. This uh, kind of Olive drab and tan, or whatever color that mustard is, was a very char you know, characteristic of Dorf Ann's uh, trains. And you see uh, these sidings that go with it. So, pretty cool for windups to have. Uh, they were also um, the first uh, company to have uh, automatic re uh, uncouple, which is amazing. So, I didn't bring it with me, but I have a device that you, you, you can control remotely. You push a button and it uncouples the cars. All the couplers were made in Europe, but uh, they were the first ones in America to do it. Here's a version. This is the Victory Tunnel O-Gauge uh, with lights. This also came without lights, and it also came with only a single uh, you know, crossing, like this one. So they made these in many different ways. Again, simple designs that you put together in different combinations to create you know, different patterns of, of uh, marketability. Of course, the more, more you got, the more you paid. Uh, my favorite bridge is this guy, which is uh, huge, right? Which is the uh, standard gauge double light. And uh, on, on, on the layout, it looks pretty impressive. So um, I love that. I have many different versions of these. They come in lots of different colors. And they're kind of neat to see side by side. And, uh, <coughs> There's one on eBay right now that is this, what they call victory. Uh, so, you know, they're rare, but, you know, not completely rare. What did um, that go for? You can expect that to go for eBay. A couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Three, four hundred bucks. Some of these sets, by the way, um, uh, you know, you're talking about a couple thousand dollars a set. This, that 770 set would be, you know, well over five thousand dollars. Those are extremely rare. Mm -hmm. I happened to pick that up uh, at the same time I bought this um, from a guy named Lou Acevedo who was, he told me stories, he used to go uh, take bottles of whiskey to Louis Hertz's house. Because Louis Hertz in, in uh, his writings wrote about this train and the O-Gage version as well. And um, this fellow went to Hertz's house, he took bottles of whiskey and he said, Louis, show me that, that standard gauge prototype train. And he said, oh, I can't be bothered, here's a picture. <laughs> they would never show it to him. So when Louis Hertz died, his estate went up for auction at Ralston. And this guy, Lou Acevedo, his name is, is a fairly famous uh, antique dealer in New York, bought the whole collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. 
there was a guy, and in fact, um, the story goes further in that um, I, I went to York one year and there was a guy with a huge trailer, a uh, Hasidic Jewish uh, couple from New York, had come down with a trailer of like a hundred sets of Dorfan trains. And I said, well, I'd like to buy some of those. And he says, no, I'm not interested in selling piecemeal. I want to sell the whole collection. I want $200,000 for the whole collection. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <laughs> you know, I didn't do that. <coughs> then I noticed a couple of them were going for sale on eBay. So I had the guy's card, and I called him up, and, and um, I said, well, where'd you get the trains? He said, I got it from Luba Savita. I traded him a painting of George Washington. It's one of the original paintings that's unfinished. I think there were three of them or seven of them or something. Traded him a painting for the collection. And I, so I went up and I bought all these trains and from, um, from this guy who had traded the painting. And he said, oh, by the way, uh, Acevedo did keep a couple of trains. And he kept this one, of course, which is why he bought the collection. <laughs> and, and a couple of others, including this set of the 770, which, if you look, if you look at it, is in mint condition. I mean, every car is perfect. Um, so when I bought the set from uh, from the Jewish couple, they said, by the way, Acevedo sold you everything, but he still got that one set. And he told you he sold you his whole collection, so he owes you that set. So I, I mentioned it to Lou, and he said, oh, yeah, come on down, and I'll give it to you. And he took me up to his, he has a bank building, and he has thousands of paintings in it. And he gave me the set, and yeah, that was it. So. What is the bank building in Lower Manhattan or where? It's uh, 72nd Street on every side, oh. mm -hmm. where Lou has a house. Oh. Mm -hmm. If you have a house in Manhattan, mm -hmm. I don't think you're a poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I wanted to point out, you can see this in the O gauge as well as the standard gauge, is uh, something that was unique to Dorfan, which was what called crackle painting. And this set is probably the best example um, of crackle painting. So let me just show you this. This car was originally painted in, well, I guess I can't show you that very easily. It doesn't show it that way. In green. <coughs> in green on the underside. Then they covered it with a lacquer, and before the lacquer dried, they painted black over it. And, the la and notice this. The lacquer costs, I want to come up later before we leave, got to get out of here time. You'll see that the crackle green is, is extremely good. Uh, I have a couple of sets that my, my friend Carl Edelinger tried to emulate, and Carl McKinney, or Carl McKinney wrote about that, that he tried to emulate it. No one has ever been able to emulate it that way. Uh, this particular engine is um, the only one I've ever seen that's a crackle green engine. Usually the engines are black that went with the set. Uh, but this one happens to be the crackle green engine, which makes it pretty unique. But these, these cars are really neat. Yeah. One of the things about Dorfan that is also a first I mentioned was the people in the car. So there are two types of people in these cars. One for the cheaper O gauge trains, which sure that this insert went inside the train, lithographed people, flat. In fact, Dorfan Dan, over here in this thing, is one of these people. <laughs> but later, these people were third, three-dimensional cast figures, hand-painted. I have pictures of some of the Dorfan factory. It shows you know, rows of ladies, hand-painting these little things. Amazing. No wonder they went bankrupt. You know, so, uh, but if you take a close look at it, it's really, they're really beautiful. Really beautiful. Some of the standard uh, O-gauge cars as well, in this set you can see the same thing. Three-dimensional cast figures, so. and you know, and the more you get into collecting something and specializing, the more you realize there's more to learn. You never know it all. And um, as I've as I've collected, I've gotten more and more interested in uh, the Forshimer brothers and John Christian Korber, and less interested in the trains. Um, although I love the trains for sure, but uh, I love the people. Thing. So what was their relationship like, the three people, the three men? Um, I don't know for sure. Um, I think they all had different things that they were good at. So Julius Forsheimer, who was the older of the two Forsheimer brothers, has a bunch of patents. And there's a bunch of writings from Louis Hertz that say that he was an engineer. And if you went into his office, he had tables all around his office. 
with parts and you know innovations and stuff that he was working on. Corbett was the same way. One of the stories that um, that you laugh about today because these trains are so fragile is that in the early days, um, John Corbett would invite kids and, and people to come visit him in the factory. That was a big thing for him. And Julius Forsheimer loved that as well. So the two of them would entertain these kids. That, I believe, was Julius Forsheimer's helping the kids set up trains. Um, John Corbett, I doubt, would be the kind of person to do that. He was a very you know, strict person. We, we know a little bit about him because of the writings of Hoods. But anyway, they said that uh, kids would come into the factory and there was a cement floor. <coughs> And he would say, kids, come on over here. Let me show you how cool this train is. And he would throw one of these standard gauge trains down on the cement floor, and it would bounce and not break. Well, right now, if you look hard at one of these, my wife says, nobody has spent so much money that is crumbling before your very eyes. And, you know, this is true. But, um, but in those days, I mean, the, the, those castings were amazing. And, and it said a lot about the brothers, that particularly Julius, that he wanted to have the kids come into the factory, and he wanted them to come visit him, and he wanted to talk to them about what they liked about the trains. Uh, one of the policies that Dorfman had, and I think it was because of, of uh, Julius Forsheimer and John Corver, was that if anything ever went wrong with any of your trains, you just either send them back or just send me a note, and I would send you either a new one or I would fix it for free. And when these started casting started to go bad, you can imagine what that meant. Uh, because every one of these early 51 castings went bad. Except that one down there, by the way. <laughs> but I mean, literally, they're as rare as hen's teeth. And the reason is that they're just crumbling. And uh, Kenny actually shows pictures in his book of a couple of the castings of, of things that are long gone. There aren't, there are no more. So they collapsed Here. very soon then after they were sold? Yeah, within a year. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you find a, a collectible one in pretty good shape, is there any way to Keep it from crumbling. Can you yeah, do I think, something I think, or not do something? I think keep it keep it in a temperature constant environment. Is it not no no humidity? Yeah, not like this room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean theoretically humidity is a killer. But I think um, <laughs> at this point, most of the damage is probably been done. Although I must say I was um, I had I had one of these trains which was actually a Relives 1134 in my collection and it was up on the, the mantelpiece and I'm. Doing something all over here, suddenly I hear ping! And parts started to fly off, and it was the casting literally exploding. And that was, what, 75, 80 years after. Uh, do you do anything special with your collection? Yeah, what I do, uh, I, I actually, uh, Peter and I were talking about it, I actually take something called TR3, which is a, uh, a metal cleaner used in the automotive field. Uh, you have to be really careful with this, and I clean all the trains. And what it does is it takes a very small layer of paint, the oxidized paint off the train, and seals the train. Um, if you do too much, it will take all the paint off. But it's like, you, you ever seen an ad for a car where they put the stuff on the car and then wipe it off and the car's bright and shiny? Well, that's what that is. It takes the very top oxidized layer of paint off and, and exposes a, a layer beneath. And if you're careful, you can almost make, well, you can see how beautiful some of these really look. They look almost new. And then I use a wax called Oz, which is a metal wax. And I try to seal the trains with those. That made pretty good one. Um, getting them to run is another story. Uh, and, and, and what really goes wrong with a lot of these is these wheels are all cast, and all the gears are, on, are cast onto the wheels. So what Carl and I, Carl Needlinger and I have done is we've found people who will make reproduction brass wheels. And you know, that does the trick. You put new wheels on the thing, you can get them to run. Um, but you know, he's, he's an expert in metal and I am, I am not. But I, you know, I spend hours and hours. I have a TV set, a stereo, I can play records. <laughs> you know, but like that for hours at a time. You said the green ones were uh, the later, and that those castings. No, in general, was the green painted trains? Uh, this one. Well, no, you you had mentioned this randomly. Oh, this one's this one's the, late. The, I only presume because it's an electric train with a wind-up button. Okay. So they were using a, a <coughs> casting, I believe, from the wind-up series. But I don't know that because every green one I've ever seen, and they, I've got two, and they're both the same, and I've seen others, and they're all they all have the button. So maybe. 
Their 1928 and 29 catalogs are a thing of incredible reading. And the amount of advertising and, and the movie and all the contests, I mean, 28 and 29 was their heyday. And, and I think they stole from Ives and Lino and American Fly that market. They, they, they were able to capture it from the European weaknesses. Um, and when the Depression hit, uh, you know, like a lot of companies, and I've worked for companies like this, if you get in debt for whatever reason, meaning you're borrowing money to do the castings or you're borrowing money because you can't meet your payments, and then you and then you can't do sales mm -hmm. and you don't have the cash, you go you can go bankrupt in a hurry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I worked for Nova Chemicals, you know, Peter. That company was the largest plastics company in North America. And within a year and a half, they almost went bankrupt. Within a year and a half. Because their whole business plan was built on maintaining debt. And when they were unable to rotate their debt because the recession prevented people from lending money, they almost folded. And, and I think that's what happened to Ives, and I think that's what happened to Dorfan. I had the bankruptcy papers from Dorfan 1936, and it was obvious that the Forsheimer brothers no longer controlled the company. And they sued to try to get bankruptcy uh, instituted so that they could get control back uh, I think I translated or did something for you for those papers. Yeah. Some of the papers are, are unreadable except by people who know how to use computers in an incredible way, like Roger. Uh, and uh, this is the creation of a Dorfman collector who told me that no good Dorfman collector could ever allow Lionel to get one up on me. <laughs> so this is a standard gauge Dorfman diner, which is identical except standard gauge. To the line elbow gauge So identical but bigger and better, right? Because it's dwarfing. It's a dwarfing car, by the way. Kind of cool. Um, Dwarfian had a rich number of accessories. They had several versions of the crossing gate. I can't, I don't want to break anything. Um, you can see this one. It works similar to some of the other accessories because it has a cylinder here and when it applied electricity, the thing went down. And and so forth. What this thing over here does, I have never been able to figure it out, so anybody who finds out, let me know. This particular signal bridge is one of two signal bridges that, that Dorfan produced. They were one of the first in the United States to do signal bridges that were electrified and remote controlled. Um, because this one is die cast, and they made another one that had a single one on top, they're incredibly rare. Incredibly rare. Um, Peter insists that I bring this thing, which I hate him to do because it's also not cast. It breaks and, really easy. But, but it is one of the most oversized and dramatic accessories ever done, and it's the Dorfman number 70 crane. T Reproductions made a beautiful reproduction of this, which you can buy for about $400 occasionally. Um, but this was Louis Hertz's. So I love it for that. It's in pretty good shape, it runs. 
it will go around and around and it will go up and down. So, oh, what more do you need? Uh, they made three different sizes of what they called composite or paper mache bridge bridge tunnels. And these tunnels are a thing of incredible beauty. Look at that, hand painted, amazing. But these were made by Fandor. If you look at the Fandor catalogs, they're identical. Except there's a little piece of paper that they glued to this little house that says Dorothy on it. There's a big one, a medium sized one, and a little one to go along with the metal ones that went with sets, although they also were sold individually. Small one and the larger one. This particular accessory is perhaps my, one of my favorite accessories. I bought this at an auction and took it home and tried to run it. I tried to um, get it to run. There were two of these cataloged. One was cataloged to work for 110 volt current, and the other was cataloged to work off track current. Okay, no big deal, right? So I tried to put a bulb into this thing, and the socket was too big. Then I tried to get a bigger socket, like a candelabra bulb or something, a Christmas tree bulb, and those were too big for the socket. So I started to do a little research on bulbs. And it turns out in the 1920s, there was a free for all in the world of consumer electronics on bulbs. And everybody had their own standard for bulbs. In fact, there are bulb museums that you can go to where there are literally thousands of different formats of bulbs that were produced between the 1880s and actually earlier than that, all the way up until the 1930s. And Thomas Edison, in his inimitable wisdom, came out with the E standard, which is what we know as the screw in light bulb, where the diameter of the light bulb became the standard. In, uh, uh, 16th of May.